Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. For those who don't know me, my name is Grace Keller. I um, worked in harm reduction in Vermont for 15 years. I don't know how many press conferences this is about overdose prevention centers for me, but um, I had to come up with some new material because I've spoken about this for a long time. Um, and today's a very exciting day. We are, we've made progress um, in a fight that we've all had the, um, for the lives of Vermonters. Um, <clears throat> so um, one of the things that's really hard to talk about as somebody who's worked in um, harm reduction is the numbers of Vermonters that we've lost to overdose. Uh, working in Burlington for 15 years at Safe Recovery, uh, one of the real, the, the benefits of harm reduction is you get to know people um, because you work with them unconditionally, whether they're using or not, whether they're struggling or not. Um, and really what this has come to is that means that for the vast majority of people who are dying in Vermont, I know them personally. I know their families, I know their dreams, I know their children, um, and often I know their successes, I know their struggles. And so for those lives to be cut short um, on our watch has been really, really traumatizing. And um, one of the great parts about being in harm reduction is you do get to keep in people's lives. They come to you because they know that you don't judge but for 15 years, I've gotten to know Vermonters and had, as a frontline worker, had my hand tied, hands tied in ways that prevent me from helping them in, in ways that really could possibly save their lives. Um, with overdose prevention centers, we often hear about what happens if we do overdose prevention centers. Will this bring on certain things? Will this take away certain things? What I can tell you is the absence of an overdose prevention center is not abstinence. This is not addressing a problem that doesn't exist. This is an answer, a, a part of a continuum of care to address a problem that very much exists already in Vermont. It very, uh, many different problems that we are facing in Vermont will be solved by this. And, and we'll talk more about how it's not a panacea, but it is a part of the continuum of care. Um, so absent of an overdose prevention center, We've lost 1,500 Vermonters to overdose since 2014. I started my job for context in 20, 2007. So that was just about halfway through my job, um, my time at Safe Recovery. We've lost 250 Vermonters in the last 12 months, according to the CDC. And we've had experienced a 200% increase between 2013 and 2022. Last week, some of you might have read that at um, UVM, UVM Medical Center, we've experienced a 900% increase wow. in endocarditis. That isn't something that people talk a lot about, um, but I, uh, the other piece of my history is that I am a master's in public health student at Brown University, um, which in many ways helps to educate me, but also helps to frustrate me, because my um, counterparts in Rhode Island are um, implementing an overdose prevention center and have um, all the resources that they need, our neighbors do. So, um, but one of the things that we've been talking about a lot in my public health classes is endocarditis because it isn't something that we talk a lot about here in Vermont. We talk about overdose um, a lot and we should be, but endocarditis is an infection of the heart that is um, got really, really serious outcomes and serious uh, implications for public health. Uh, we have, like, like I said at UVM Medical Center, there was a 900% increase in endocarditis, and many of those people go untreated because they don't stay in the hospital. And I don't have to be a public health student to tell you that untreated major infections are a public health risk to everyone. Um, but more importantly, we are losing Vermonters in the prime of their life. The, um, the estimates also are that by 2030, more people will have died by, from endocarditis than from overdose in the injection drug user population. So um, we, the projections are that we're expected to lose at least 257,000 people to endocarditis by 2030. And they're saying that one in five people who use injection drugs will die of endocarditis. By, in 2030. 
So that's really what we're facing. It's not something that we talk about all the time. It's something that's very real. It's something that's very preventable. Endocarditis is something that starts with an infection that can be solved by an antibiotic. It's that we, our system of care really needs to add in resources for people to be in a safe place, to have access to safe supplies, to have caring professionals around them that can support them and get them an antibiotic or help accompany them to the hospital. And I've seen it firsthand. I have taken many people to the hospital. I have worked with many people. And just having somebody to go with you that you know that isn't judging you makes a huge difference in the outcomes of people staying, of people getting treated, and of people accessing care early. Um, one of the other things that's happening, absent of an um, overdose prevention center, is that um, overdose is the leading cause of perinatal mortality in Vermont. Now, these are other things that we aren't hearing about, that we're not talking about, um, but that it, but is, is a very real situation. So when we talk also, one of the arguments that you'll often hear about overdose prevention centers is that we really should be focusing on prevention. And what I like to t say is that the best prevention we could be doing for any child is keeping their parents alive. I'm, and when you, when you look at an 11-year-old and they've lost their parent to overdose, you're really, no intervention that they're going to experience in school is going to reverse that. So we really need to work on keeping kids' parents alive if we really want to talk about prevention. And I know personally that there are kids in Vermont who have lost both of their parents to overdose. And we have to answer to those kids right now and give interventions that could, have, could prevent this happening to other children. Um, the other thing that we are having, the, the other thing that's created with um, not having overdose prevention centers is that our front lines are being traumatized. Um, we are experiencing in Vermont already a serious gap in frontline service workers. But I can tell you myself, as somebody who's reversed over 25 overdoses, um, and had to actually do rescue breathing, sometimes for over eight minutes, that, that, is, that, that we need to be giving people the resources that they have to best handle that situation. I went to Vancouver in 2018, this is how long we've been talking about this, to look at what they have there. And I was really emotional because when they have an overdose, they know in real time when that person used, how much time that person has been unconscious, how much time that person potentially has needed care. When it's happened to us in Burlington, the person has been brought there in a car by a friend, a family member, or a good Samaritan, and they have no idea how long that person has been blue, not breathing. And honestly, even as somebody who's a professional who's trained more people in overdose um, response than anyone in the state, the truth of the matter is, you have no way of telling how long somebody's been in that state. Time slows down. It could be two hours, and it could be three minutes, it feels like. So the last time I, I've, I've talked about this before, but the last time I responded to overdose in Burlington, the person had a dog in their car that was their dog that thought that I was hurting them. So as I was giving them rescue breathing, the dog was jumping up and attempting to bite my face. And not biting my face, but warning me, because they were also scared. Um, and this is what our frontline workers, and before now, I, was, uh, I had a bachelor's in philosophy. So that's not the person that should be responding on the front lines <laughs> to, to an overdose as serious as that. And we were downtown Burlington at the top of Church Street, and response time was just under eight minutes. So, um, so that's, that's another piece of this that we should be talking about. The last thing, one of the last things you hear often is that it, this is not a panacea. And no one knows that more than the frontline workers and the people who love people who use drugs. This is not a panacea. It's, a, it's the next step in a continuum of care. It's the step we've been needing. It's the step we're lacking. But what is a panacea in overdose, the, the things that we know can save someone's life are time, response time, and having someone present. So when we talk about a panacea, what we need is Vermonters to stop dying alone, which the, according to the Department of Health, the vast majority do. And we need to be giving the people responding as much time as possible to respond. When I was in Vancouver, you could see that so, if somebody overdosed, within seconds somebody was there. For us, the only reason that we did not experience an overdose death at Safe Recovery was luck. Luck is not a panacea. 
It's never going to be. We need to prepare people with what we know works, what the evidence tells us works. The evidence is strong. We've got 20 years of evidence. We now have the National Institute of Health on board to study this in the United States. We have two overdose prevention centers that opened in New York City. Our neighbors in Rhode Island are going to be opening one this summer. Um, and the truth is, I've worked with a lot of families and people who've lost someone to overdose. And can you imagine if you had something that knew that could save your, your loved one's life and your neighbors had it and something as arbitrary as a state line made it so that you didn't or your child didn't or your parent didn't, it would be devastating. So we need to really look at how we're, how we're addressing this and how we're going to come into the times with a shared sense of urgency. Um, the last thing that I hear, oh, also for the not a panacea, there's very few public health or health interventions that are. Chemotherapy is not a panacea. Have you ever heard of anybody talking about not doing chemotherapy? We don't have panaceas. What we have is continuums of care, and we need comprehensive continuums of care. Um, one of the last things that you'll hear, too, is that in Vermont, it won't save everybody. Um, it's hard to say this without coming across a certain way, but um, it's a horrible public health uh, um, statement. But also, it won't save everybody, but it, it will save somebody, and everybody is somebody to somebody else. So everybody's life matters. Um, and the more we can build this out, the more we can get this up and moving, um, the more that we can really save people's lives. And when you're talking about prevention, saving one parent's life is a huge deal for a child. Saving one child's life is a huge deal. So we really need to, to talk about that. Um, I can talk also, I think we've all talked about what overdose prevention centers do. Um, they connect people to care. They establish a safe relationship for people. They often are seeing populations that no one else has access to, like victims of human trafficking, victims of domestic violence. Um, so really, you have a caring group of people that are coming together in, behind me and with me, um, all people who have don't come to this lightly, come to this because they're victims of the um, overdose crisis, come to this because they've worked on the front lines of the overdose crisis, and come to us because we really care and we are, and we are looking to implement this in Vermont. We want to thank the House and Senate for all of their hard work. And um, you don't have to take this from me. We've got a group of us that are going to talk to you today. Um, thank you so much for coming. And uh, we we'll look forward to moving forward with this in Vermont. Oh, you get an MC too. Our next. I forgot I was the MC also. Our next speaker is um, somebody I can't even introduce in a, com um, in a complete way because uh, she is the, my, in many ways my partner in crime in all of this. Um, but she is uh, an incredibly powerful woman, an incredibly powerful force in this field, and um, really the voice we need to be hearing from next. So this is Jessica Kirby. Thank you. Am I okay with this? Is this the right height for me? Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Grace. Okay. Make sure I don't forget it's there. <laughs> Make me more nervous. Um, okay. Thank you so much, Grace. I agree with every word you said that this is something that we desperately need, and I'm really happy to be here to talk about it today. Uh, my name is Jess Kirby. I'm the Director of Client Services at Vermonters for Criminal Justice Reform. I've been working in harm reduction and syringe exchange and on the front lines of the opioid crisis for the past 10 years. But opioid use and being a part of the opioid crisis has been in my life for a lot longer than that. Um, I'm a person with lived experience. Um, and um, I spent many years of my life uh, struggling with opioids, and um, I'm really lucky to be here today to talk to you all about it, um, about this. Um, I want to start by thanking the House and the Senate for their dedication to saving the lives of Vermonters at risk by seeking to lower barriers, expand treatment and harm reduction, and for supporting H72 and overdose prevention centers. 
Um, like I said, I spent many years of my life struggling with opioid use. Um, I am still in treatment today. I waited many years for treatment on a wait list. Um, I experienced overdoses. I re reversed the overdoses of others, and I've lost a lot of people that I really care about and love. There's not a day in my life that goes by that I'm not worrying about someone dying of an overdose, and usually many people. Um, in my life, overdose and overdose deaths and all the harms and trauma in between is a constant reality. I see it every day, but I understand it's not the case for everyone, but from people who, who are a part of this every day, I hope that people will hear that many, many people are dying and we need to be doing different things, vastly different things. Um, I look at how we respond in other circumstances when many, many people are dying, um, and I see that we move mountains, we call for emergencies, we have daily news updates, everyone's talking about it, we respond with utmost urgency, and we make it unacceptable, and I don't think we've done that in response to overdose deaths and we need to be, and we need to make it unacceptable, and we need to do things that bend our comfort level, especially if we know they work, and they respond to the one thing that we have not found a way to address, and that's people using alone. Um, the majority of the people I see every day could die that same day, and I wonder every day as people leave if I'll ever see them again. The efforts that people make to stay alive and keep each other alive is, honestly heroic um, the way that people take care of each other but they need more of our help and they need more of the system's help to respond um, realistic help and help that really meets them where they are people are really really beaten down it's true when people say that things are worse than ever and more people are struggling in a more severe way than ever and people do have wounds that are really serious and infections that are really serious and people are exhausted and a lot of people feel really thrown away and like things just don't work for them and it's hard to see every day um, but we need more places where people feel welcome and important and services that work for them and they're and it's honestly still rare like it's not everywhere that people go you know when people are using drugs they don't get greeted in that way and overdose prevention centers are exactly that so if you were seeing and doing what I was doing every day you would know that it's what the next step and what we need to be doing. Um, we need to bring people inside. We need to help them with the biggest risk of all that we have not found a way to address. We need to accept people when they're struggling the most. Um, and it's the number. this is the number one way we can do that. And I just know that it will help us to also help people with wounds and help people that feel forgotten and help people that feel like they have nowhere to turn for treatment and housing and all of these things. It's a way to bring people in that aren't getting access other places or are very in and out of, of the places that they are accessing. The worst part of my job is worrying about people. I love my job, but it's also um, really difficult. Um, you know, I've been working at people who are at risk of dying every day, people that have multiple overdoses per week. Um, at, at VCJR, we have a contingency management program, and every week um, we have sessions where we talk to people about their experiences and, that week, and we ask people if they've used a loan, and very often uh, the, the answer is yes, if they've used a loan in the past week. Um, everybody pretty much has at least once um, in that past week and we hear about the barriers to not using a loan uh, the efforts to not use a loan that people make the fear and anxiety and shame that people experience um, at this point in my life and in my career I've had probably thousands of conversations about the dangers of using a loan I brainstorm with people I've been on the phone with people who needed someone on the other end just in case I've got into my phone and saw a text from somebody who said hey I'm gonna I'm gonna use right now and I don't have anybody to use with but I wanted to let you know and I'll see that two hours later and have my heart drop for the millionth time that week <laughs> um, I have connected countless people to medication assisted treatment I drive people to their first day of treatment, I bring people to inpatient treatment, you know, I support and console people who have experienced overdoses or reversed an overdose or lost a partner or a friend. Um, I have trained and given out probably thousands of doses of Narcan and reversed many myself. I have experienced overdoses myself and um, 
I know that for sure the next step that we need with all of that experience that I have and what I see every day is absolutely overdose prevention centers. And I think the risk that we hear somebody talk about is uh, extremely minimal and not realistic, especially in comparison to what we're seeing with the way that people are suffering and dying. With all that we've done, we've done a lot, and we're not addressing the biggest risk of all, and that's people using alone. And this is the way to address that. People have no other option, um, and it's really what people need. Last week, I responded to an overdose outside of my office um, and gave someone Narcan and was able to revive them. They're still here today because of it. They might not have been if I didn't you know, hear someone that was just walking by yelling um, for Narcan. I uh, talked to them after, and um, I told his partner, who was talking about reversing multiple overdoses a week for him, um, that I was coming to do this today. And I asked her if there was anything that she would want to say, and I want to leave off with sharing with you guys what she said. Um, she said, please tell them, it's going to make me cry, that my partner wants to live, that my friends want to live, that we try our best to save each other, but it's exhausting and we need help. The number one risk is using alone and in unsafe ways, and some people don't have a choice. People think treatment is easy and recovery is easy, and it's not. It's the hardest thing in the world. And there's a way to change the risk of people using alone, and we're not doing it, and that really hurts. I think Vermont will do it, that it will happen. My partner's tried so many times to stop using, and he's done it before, but it's a long road to get back there with lots of hoops to jump through and problems to solve. Methadone is hard for him, and bup doesn't work for him, but he does want to change. He really does, but it takes time. I'm going to be here for him while he waits. I just, I, it takes different lengths of time and different things for everyone. I just hope that he's still here when we get OPCs. I would tell people on behalf of all the people who have died, those who might die tomorrow, and all of us who need people to fight for us in ways that we can't, please, please do whatever you can to make OPCs a reality. I hope it's not too late. So that's what she asked me to share. Thank you. I'm done. Thank you. So um, the next person who's going to speak is a community member. Um, and I wanted to remind people we've had over 500 Vermonters sign a letter saying that they support overdose prevention centers. That's from 70 different towns. And that represents, and also 50 different organizations have signed on. So there is a broad support from Vermonters in this. One of those is uh, Alyssa Jonk. And I'm going to have her come up next. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, I'm uh, the Reverend Alyssa Jonk, and I'm the lead minister at the First Congregational Church, United Church of Christ in Burlington, Vermont. I'm here representing folks from Vermont Interfaith Action because I, like so many of my clergy colleagues, have become a different kind of frontline responder. I went in for Easter morning services to find a woman passed out behind our bushes. This is not an unusual occurrence. In fact, let me tell you some of the things I've learned in the last five years. Things they didn't teach me in seminary. How to tell when someone is on a bad trip versus when you need to call the ambulance. What bone looks like when it's been eaten away by animal tranquilizer. And how to treat it. I know how to get blood out of just about anything. I know how to bury parents with their seven-year-old watching. And I know how to bury youth with their parents watching. I know what goes into a harm reduction kit, and so do our kindergartners, because saving lives is what we do as Vermonters. I have done all of these things. We all have. So has my office manager, a woman in her 20s. So has every other business owner downtown. I have learned how to hold worship as an ambulance goes by, not twice, but three times in an hour. Do you know what it's like to hold that despair inside the sanctuary, not just out there? Because not having an overdose prevention center means we are asking the rest of us, store clerks, librarians, office managers, shop owners, to be counselors and medics and cleaners. 
the burden on our emergency teams and on our businesses and on our cities, it is too heavy to bear. Not having an overdose prevention center puts the burden on all of us. And we are not able to hold it. A few months ago, I had a youth come across a man who couldn't be roused with the needle still in his arm, and she cried to me that she didn't want to live here anymore because the addiction is too hard to see every day. I've held hands with folks on the church porch as they cry about not wanting to do this, tell me how many times they've been in and out of rehab, and say, no one will look at me, no one wants to see me. But it's not quite true. We all see them. We just don't want to. And do you know what that does to us? It's called moral injury. It's the psychological and spiritual impact of watching addiction rot our neighbors and our neighborhoods. And it's a betrayal of the values and morals that we all claim to hold. That moral injury is also rotting away in us. It's rotting away our values, our sense of community, to believe one thing and then walk by a different reality each, way, each day and be told that there's nothing you can do. Now, I'm here today representing Vermont Interfaith Action. We've been working for over a decade. I've been working with them for over a decade on issues Vermonters care about, bringing folks from many traditions together around shared values those groups have. Things like public safety, criminal justice reform, economic disparities, housing, and all of those research groups have become interested in addiction because it affects all of it. And our groups, which represent community engagement, have easily followed the research, right? The clergy that I work with in our congregations have readily grasped that overdose prevention centers provide an alternative path to the death and the spiritual despair that we see take over. Now we all know that the status quo isn't working. It's not working for anyone. And we all recognize that Vermont values demand that we follow the research that we follow the ways that save lives like we would any other disease, and we treat folks with addiction as human beings. Right? That's just a moral imperative, and it shouldn't be up for debate. I've had my youth group pick up our front steps after a night with a lot of activity, and I've watched their faces crumble as they realize the folks that they normally avert their eyes from are, in fact, real people. Right? They see photos of children that have fallen out of wallets. They've seen well-used baseball gloves. They see lives on those steps. Now, I wish I could do the same for every Vermonter who has questions. Because our youth have been taught by us that there's nothing we can do, and that's a lie. It's a lie. And I am so proud of the communities that have worked together. I'm so proud of our legislators for following the research and paying attention to that moral voice, that still small voice that we all have that says we can do better, and then actually doing it. We have followed fear long enough. So let's follow research. Let's follow one another. And let's follow life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Our next um, speaker almost doesn't need an introduction, um, has worked tirelessly on this when he's not working on it. He's been losing sleep over it. He's a very, very essential voice in this fight. Um, the next person up is Ed Baker. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Grace, for a kind introduction. But more so, thank you for your life and the work uh, that you've done on behalf of uh, people at risk for drug overdose death in Vermont. I, I, for my part today, I'd like to take a brief moment and, um, and just have a, a moment of reverent silence for those loved ones that have been taken from us by drug overdose death, please, please join me. Thank you. 
You know, I'm a person who I consider myself uh, a, a student of what I like to call addiction health care. I'm a person uh, in recovery from the most severe drug use disorder characterized by injection drug use in years of being unhoused. I'm also a master's level social worker. I've concluded a 30-year uh, practice, a clinical practice here in Vermont, working exclusively with people with substance use disorder. And in my retirement, I'm an activist. I'm an advocate. And uh, along with Grace and some others in this room and many others. And um, this is a way of life for us because someone mentioned a moral imperative. Because it's a moral imperative, we can't live with ourselves unless we do something about this. The Vermont legislature is poised today to pass H-72, an act which will allow and support the creation of Vermont's first overdose prevention center in Burlington, Vermont. Chittenden County has led Vermont in accidental drug overdose consistently with drug overdose deaths being concentrated in downtown Burlington. You've heard it tonight. You've heard it from people on the front lines. You've heard it from the clergy. You've heard it from people with lived experience. Burlington, Vermont, tragically, is the epicenter of death in Vermont. There's death all over Vermont. We're overwhelmed by it, but most concentrated in Burlington. And Burlington will be the place where our first overdose prevention center is located, and rightly so. The current situation is and has been for quite some time, nothing short of an undeclared public health emergency. Both our prior mayor and our current mayor, our city council, our Chittenden County State's Attorney, the clergy, thousands and thousands of, of Burlingtonians, shopkeepers, municipal employees have been calling out for an overdose prevention center. They have been heard. The community of people using drugs in Burlington has also very, very clearly expressed, I think uh, Grace and, and uh, Jess, maybe Tom Dalton, others, Selena, were involved in research a number of years ago, polling people who use drugs. Over 90% of them were willing to use an overdose prevention center, motivated to use an overdose prevention center. Today, both the House and the Senate will pass H-72. It will be sent to the governor's office. There's a resounding vote of yes. Yes. Yes to compassion. Yes, yes, to a non-punitive approach to a population in need of safety, in need of protection, and in need of quality health care. To our esteemed House and our esteemed Senate, a resounding bravo, bravo to you. And also to you, the deepest felt gratitude from Team Sharing Vermont. Team Sharing Vermont is a group of our wonderful parents in Vermont who have lost their beautiful children to accidental drug overdose. They thank you, Vermont House and Senate. They thank you, supporters of this bill, for finally putting something in place to save other parents' children going forward. Make no mistake about it, this vote represents the culmination of many years of advocacy, many years of commitment 
to providing quality health care to Vermonters suffering with substance use disorder, a medically diagnosable and treatable condition. Tragically, this effort has progressed very slowly, costing many lives because of stigma and entrenched opposition to controversial innovation in healthcare. This will change today with this historic vote. The will of the people has been expressed with confidence, with conviction. The will of the people has been heard. The will of the people will be done. We, Vermonters, choose to stand with our family members and our neighbors at high risk for accidental drug overdose. We, Vermonters, choose compassion. We choose to embrace science we choose to embrace research, and we choose to provide immediate access to life-saving interventions in the form of an overdose prevention center in Vermont for our fellow Vermonters. Thank you. Thank you to Ed and all of our speakers. Um, I stood here before, this is going to sound crazy, I stood here before talking about Narcan, before we had Narcan or Naloxone, and people told me it wasn't a silver bullet. I opened an overdose or uh, um, on-site, on-demand treatment center and a syringe exchange, and people told me the DEA was going to come for me. Literally, people called me and told me the DEA was going to come for me, knock down our door. Now, we know those things as ubiquitous, we know them as the tools that we have in our tool belt, and no one would say that to you with a straight face anymore. And the day is going to come, for most of us, it already has been here for many years, but the day is going to come where we're going to think that way about overdose prevention centers. And the amount of time we can shorten the stigma that we're facing and just make that day today is going to save lives. It'll save lives at Jess's office. Um, it'll save lives of people we all know. Um, the low barrier treatment program that I started was with Dr. Blake that uh, is part of team sharing. And so I represent in front, of me, in front of you the Overdose Prevention Network, the group of people here. Like I said, there, many of them are victims of the overdose crisis. Many of them love somebody who has died of overdose. Many of them are community members. And um, people who, uh, like um, Alyssa who have been fighting this just in the community. There are people like her everywhere that we don't know, care this much, want this to happen, want our neighborhoods to be have what they need, and give them this valuable resource to Vermont. So um, I, I know that we all know that the research is there. The research has been there, 20 years of research, over 100 countries, no one's ever died. The NIH is involved at this point. We know the research is there. What we, what we need to be expressing is that our community is there. Our family members are there. Our frontline workers are there. It is proven to reduce um, syringe waste. It's proven to reduce overdose. Yes, we know those things. But we need to hear the voices of the people that are experiencing this, that are taking the time today to come down and talk to you all. And this is a tiny portion of the people that I've witnessed, talked to, if you think of the 5,000 members that Safe Recovery had, all of those voices are silent. We are the privileged voices here in front of you, um, and we are the people that are really ready to implement this, have the, the whole world behind us in research and implementation strategies. People are ready to go. Um, so what we need with our joint sense of urgency is for us to pass this bill and get moving. 
One of the really nice parts about this too is there's, there aren't taxpayer dollars involved at this point. The money that would be funding an overdose prevention center is money that came from the drug companies to mitigate these harms that we're all talking to you about. There's no better way to save lives and spend that money and keep people's kids, kids' parents alive, keep our Vermonters alive. So that's really what we're talking about today. So you can listen to the research. I can tell you the research. You want to ask questions, I, got, I can do research all day. But you need to listen to the people that love people that use drugs, the people that love, have family members that use drugs, the people that use our parks, the people that are in our churches. That's who we need to listen to at this point. And, and it is a resounding support. Um, I think also in Burlington, the entire city is ready to go. We have been talking about this for a long time. I think also the more recent votes and elections or referendums on that, we are ready to go in Burlington. Um, that's the nice part about harm reduction is we are doing everything else in the meantime. So turnkey is almost always right there. Um, it's the resource that we're just, we're, we're missing. And, um, and absent of that, there's a, an incredible amount of harm being caused. So thank you all for coming today. We're here for questions, um, if anybody has them. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's uh, bring our joint sense of urgency to the pen and have this bill go through and let's, and let's move forward and, and start, start implementing these services by people who would love to, to bring them to Vermont. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody, anybody have questions? I just had one question. Sure. I kind of get to the whole the, the point I think you made about like this isn't a panacea. When the on point New York folks testified, they said like this is a specific medical intervention. I think is how they put it. <laughs> Law enforcement and service providers are also citing sort of a rise in methamphetamines. How do you, which is a totally different drug than xylazine or fentanyl? How do you see these centers interacting with or playing a role? I guess with that relationship between the rise of methamphetamines and these overdose prevention centers? That's a really good question. Um, and I can answer that. I think also I'll bring Jess up here with me to answer it too. Um, first of all, the, populate, the group of people that are, would be implementing this or looking at implementing this are people that are already working with those people. The critical piece of this is the relationship that people have with um, people who use drugs. There's a trusting relationship with the population. Um, but Jess and I actually worked together when methamphetamine hit Vermont. And it does sound like an after school special or something like that to say when methamphetamine hit Vermont. But we have had our finger on the pulse and we knew, we knew pretty, pretty much in the same week or two that things were changing and shifting. Um, and, and you mentioned Frontline, like the Burlington Fire Department chief is now supportive of this. So we, we were all um, sort of trying to address that. So these are all, this, and many times, the same people. Um, so this would be an added step and added, you know, in addition to what they're already getting at a syringe exchange or a place like Vermonters for Criminal Justice Reform. Um, and it is a very specific intervention. I think people worry about the general population, the general public. This is a specific intervention for very specific people who are injecting drugs. It is not you know, I know there's a lot of concern about our youth. This is a very, very specific intervention for people who are at risk for overdose, who are injecting drugs. I think you, Jess works with people really closely in day-to-day -day now, so I, I'm gonna let her answer that too. Um, I would say how, uh, how people who are using methamphetamine fit into this and how that response looks. It's, I really think that um, we do have a situation with methamphetamine going on, and sometimes people are experiencing psychosis and you know behaviors that are challenging in the community. And I think that we want those people to be welcome inside with people that are wanting to help address those things, that are wanting to help de-escalate, that are wanting to help people get to levels of care that they need, if, if, if that's where it's at. Wanting to help people get to the hospital if that's what they need. I think we want people to be inside and working with people who are not judging them who understand what they're going through, who are equipped with resources to help them get through that and and 
I think that that is what we would want to see much more than uh, people using on the street and having no one to be helping working through what's going on and these scary thoughts that I'm having and I don't know where to go and what to do and I have no one to talk to and maybe that presents in a way that's, <clears throat> you know, alarming to people outside that don't know, you know, what to expect. I think we want people to be inside and having those things addressed by the people that should be addressing them. Yeah. So, uh, Okay. When do you think the earliest you could open a site, given that we've got rules that still have to get drafted and land use permitting processes to go through? Um, I have no idea. Uh, what I think is it could be done very quickly. I think it does not take as much. We need trained people, which we have. We have people that want to do it, which we have. We need sterile, you know, places for people to to do this we need supplies um, and I think that it could be done very quickly if we don't completely overcomplicate it and make it take years I think it could be done in six months if we wanted it to. Is there a specific location yet identified building or organization that would run the center yet? There's, there's not. I know that there are programs that are interested um, and I know that it's my dream to work at an overdose prevention center and I hope I will get to one day. Um, and um, But I know that there are definitely people who are interested but I don't think anybody's been identified as the person. One of the things also that comes up a lot that I think would be good to address too is the, um, I know that a lot of people bring up what happens if someone drives. Um, and I, w I do want to address that because it's very, very rare that somebody drives. At, at Safe Recovery, we had 5,000 clients I mentioned. Very few people have cars, very few people drive. What I can say is this is n the reason to have an overdose prevention center. We talk about that, is this the reason not to? What we have right now is unsafe injection sites all over our state. And people, like I did a training, for overdose prevention training at the Intervale. Their staff is coming up upon people all the time that they're worried about for overdose. And somebody, we know that people use in their cars the, the, the rare people that do have them. So what that looks like is somebody's in the Intervale, somebody's in a rural road, they get scared, they start driving. What an overdose prevention center offers us is an opportunity for intervention. At Safe Recovery, we had people that would be a, a, a bit intoxicated and would have a car there. We have the relationship with them to say, hey, why don't you sit here for a bit? Why don't we get you some food? Why don't I give you a ride home? Why don't we get you a cab? Um, and we did that over and over and over again. I can tell you, I was a bartender for years and not having that relationship with people and ha is very different. It looked, we never had anybody walk out on us, say they were gonna drive anyway. People always availed. It was like as if your family member said at Thanksgiving, hey, you've had a little too much to drink. Why don't you spend the night? Why don't you, I mean, they don't spend the night, but why don't you take a ride from us? Why don't you have a sandwich? You know, so this is an actual reason to do it, not the reason that keeps coming up as the exception of why we shouldn't. It's because we have trained professionals who have deep and trusting relationships with these people who may be struggling and who may um, just need that extra spot, may not realize they're too intoxicated to, dr not to drive. And we literally have driven people home. We've bought them dinner. We've bought them lunch. We've let them nap. We've um, put them in cabs, uh, just like you would do for your friends and family members. So I just wanted to put that out there that that's, you know, in the many, many years we've been fighting for this, that's what comes up. And I want to say yes and that's why we would do this, so. Probably have time for one more quick question and then wrap up. That would be So, Selena, let me just, I want to address uh, the, comment, the comment about uh, the timeline. The, the, the original timeline was for the Department of Health to have regulations completed by September of 2025. The Senate, in its wisdom, and the House and Senate in this Bill H-72 changed that date and moved it up one full year out of recognition of the urgency, uh, our need for, a, for an immediate um, intervention in the form of an overdose prevention center. There are regulations that have been fully developed in Rhode Island. There are regulations that have been fully developed in New York. And these regulations can serve as a, an example for Vermont. So the other thing about the city, I know for a fact that 
city government is looking into ordinances, um, different types of zoning requirements as we speak. So, you know, we're, we're, we're moving forward now at a, a hasty pace, I would say. Thank you all so much for being here and good luck with the rest of your task covering the session. Yes.